What's going on around here? August 11th was yesterday, 12th today, 13th, 14th, 15th. Have you heard all the predictions about what's going to happen, what's being happening, what's going on? Well, we're fortunate that Karen McCoy is with us and happened to be in, in the city also speaking. So it's up to her now to explain to us as an, a professional astrologer from Florida, and she's not on your program, that's in the next uh, program slot, as to what's going on with this big uh, Grand Cross thing. So welcome, Karen McCoy, and here she is. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Hi. Well, it's a great honor to be asked to speak here. Um, I've never been involved in a global congress before. I don't, but I'm loving being here. And when we had the speakers meeting this morning and I listened to everyone, it was like I just wanted to come and hear everyone speak. But I'm here to speak to you about eclipses because that's my specialty and what's going on right now. Um, this is me, Spiritual Astrology by Spiller and McCoy. We have none here because I'm not ready to sell anything here just to talk to you. Um, but if you see it in the bookstore, you know who it is. Now, yesterday we had an eclipse and it was a very wonderful eclipse. We had a different kind of eclipse two weeks ago. On the 28th of July, we had an eclipse, a south nodal eclipse. I don't, I, do many of you study astrology? I'm not familiar with this group. How many astrologers do we have? Two. Okay, I won't talk astrological lingo to you then. Anyway, we had an eclipse two weeks ago um, on the 28th of July that was quite a difficult eclipse that we've been building up for for a long time. Nin 1999 probably being one of the more difficult years on the planet relative to clearing our stuff, clearing our energy, getting ready for um, the new millennium, getting ready for a new consciousness that is in the process of stepping forward on the planet. And this all started back, to explain the story, I have to go back a little bit. It started back um, in 1972, when the old reality began breaking down on the planet. Every 171 years, we go through a different cycle. And this cycle is, um, comes in when Uranus and Neptune, the planet, the Uranus, the planet of change, and Neptune, the planet of the illusion, the planet of what our reality is on this plane, comes together every 171 years. And we have things in astrology called cycles. They're like the phases of the moon. And every planet's relationship with another planet goes through eight phases, just like each month the sun and the moon goes through eight phases. Well, the last phase, the balsamic phase, is the breaking down phase. And so we created a reality on the planet a long time ago that said, that it was during the time of the Industrial Revolution that we had to work hard for what we wanted and we had a certain work ethic and we were all going to work for unions and we were going to get ahead and we were going to do our 20 years and our 25 years and we would have our Social Security and our future would be taken care of and we invested our future in government and in big business. And since 1972, the reality of that has been breaking down on the planet. We've been all finding out that we have to invest our future in ourselves and no one else but ourselves. And so slowly that dream has been dissolving, but dissolving for a purpose, to empower us to learn to take control of our own lives, our own destinies, our own future. And then in 1993, we began creating a new vision on the planet because these two planets once again came together, Uranus and Neptune. And each phase, takes approximately 21 years. So we have 21 years to create the reality in which the next several generations will live with. So it's quite an honor and quite a blessing to be alive at this time on the planet because it means that you are one of the souls that are given the responsibility of creating this vision. And so this vision is created from 1993 to 2014. And during this period of time, we have to really choose to live consciously, choose to make sure we don't close our eyes. This is one of the reasons why I'm so excited about this Congress. I didn't even know that there were people that came together and shared information like y'all share here. It's such a wonderful thing. And because you don't close your eyes, 
you notice something and you find a platform and you share it with one another so that we all live consciously because if we go back into the old reality and we don't share the things that we notice and we just say, well, that's not pleasant, I'm just going to turn away and make believe I don't see it, then we can't change it, we can't alter it. And we end up bringing some of that old reality that doesn't work into our new reality. And it's our responsibility to make sure that that doesn't happen. And we have an opportunity right now until 2014 to create whatever reality we desire. And part of that is by living consciously and not closing our eyes. Because if we make believe we don't notice or we don't say anything about something we know to be wrong, it is the same exact thing as giving it approval. Right? Because if you don't, if you see somebody treating someone poorly and you walk away, or you don't take time to do the things that you know are necessary to do to be a good human being, then it, you're, you're saying that it's okay to do that. And it's part of learning right now that it's not okay. So that's the first part of what's going on. The other thing that's going on that started in 1999, this year on January 14th, is from January 14th through until March 18th, all of us began a process which brought up a tremendous amount of annoyance, fear, aggravation, stress, that was supposed to come to the surface to make us begin to look at that which was no longer working in our life. Because 1999 is the year of change. So we had to look at what was working and what wasn't working. And then, um, as this stress built and it climbed, we began to look at the things that didn't work so that we could make the decisions about what we were going to change. This works better. <laughs> okay. All right. And then, that's, that's the planet Mars. We have things in astrology where planets go through station points and where they go through shadows. And every two years, the planet Mars retrogrades. And when it retrogrades, it means we take a step back from how we're sharing our energy on the planet and we relook at the direction we've pointed ourselves. So we had this stress period that began to unravel for us from January 14th to March 18th. And then on March 18th until June 4th, we saw that the solutions for solving these problems began to come to the surface. But we weren't able to take action yet. So first came the stress or the fear or the anxiety. Then came the awareness, the solution, how to solve it, but an inability to take action. And then from the 4th of June until the 4th of August, the ability to take action on fixing the things that was causing you stress and aggravation was then available to you. Okay, so that's the first step. Now Mars is the masculine energy, and Venus is the feminine energy. Now every 3,500 years, there is a shift of power, a shift of balance on the planet from masculine to feminine. And so 3,500 years ago, the feminine energy was in power on the planet at that particular time. Now, at this particular time, we are shifting back from masculine back to feminine. But a very interesting thing is taking place this time is that we have an opportunity for the first time in the creation of humankind of balancing the energy where not one is in control any longer, but it's a shared energy on the planet. And you see what happens here is every 3,500 years when it shifts in the past, everyone has said, well, you know, you guys were in charge for a long time, and it's our turn. And you guys were kind of mean to us when you were in charge, so we don't want to share the power with you this time. We're just, we're just going to take over, and we're going to go for it, and we're going to suppress you. And it's been our history, that competition between masculine and feminine energy. Now, you have to remember that all of us carry masculine and feminine energy inside of ourselves. And when we're in competition with the masculine and feminine energy outside of ourselves, it's because we're really not in harmony with the masculine and feminine energy inside of ourselves. So it's not about men being in power and women being in power, though we've played it out that way on the planet for millions of years. It is really about us being in balance inside of ourselves. And we're being taught how to create that balance at this particular time on the planet. And it's why so much stress is coming to the surface to force us to deal with our internal issues. Now, astrologically, Mars is like the foot soldier of Venus. Even though the male energy has been in charge for 3,500 years, 
Venus tells Mars what she wants. And Mars goes off running around all around the zodiac, getting Venus what she wants, comes running up, lays it at her feet. And Venus, the feminine energy, steps back, looks at what Mars brought her, looks at Mars, and says, I told you I wanted that in green. <laughs> and so Mars has spent many, many years, eons, trying to make Venus happy. And the bottom line is nobody can make Venus happy but Venus. And so during the course of this century, the Venusian energy preparing, <coughs> excuse me, preparing for what is going on now, and we always prepare in the vision before. And so the vision before being um, 171 years ago, well, that was in 1993, so if we do our math on that, someone here's got to be better at math than me with all these brilliant minds. That 1821 is when we created the last vision on the planet. And so back at that time is when women really started stepping forward, slowly but surely, saying, I want out of the kitchen. I want out of the house. I want to go out into the world and make a place for myself. I want to be an equal. So we started in this last Uranus-Neptune cycle stepping out there. And every time we popped our head out, someone would push us back down again and say, no, it's not time. But we had to start paving the road. And so for all of those women that paved the road for the feminine energy to step forward, um, those of you that carry masculine energy better say thank you. Because you have to be tired of being a foot soldier. You have to be tired of running around trying to make someone happy when you truly know they can only make themselves happy. You all know that that's impossible to make someone else happy. Anybody ever try to have a relationship with an unhappy person? <laughs> and think you could keep them happy? There is no way. You have to be with them 24-7. You can't leave their side. When they want to watch television, you've got to sit down and watch television. You just can't do anything but be with them. And so we've been out of balance for a long time, so this is a wonderful thing that's happening on the planet now. But we don't know how to love in a balanced way. We only know how to take. We only know how to ask for what we want. We don't know how to meet our own needs. So in 1999, these two planets, Venus and Mars, both retrograde this year, and their shadows overlap. Because Mars steps back and it said to Venus, it says, I'm not doing it anymore. You are going to have to learn to get your own needs met. And so people that are in relationships where they are overly dependent on the other person, those relationships have been breaking up. Those relationships have been having problems. Or the person that is not stepping forward, the one that is, is starting to have financial difficulty, forcing the one that isn't stepping forward to assist and to do something about it. Because we're supposed to be learning how to share energy and to share power at this particular time. Now, Venus said, well, you know, I'm not used to going out there and working. I'm not used to running around and taking care of my own needs. I have been very accustomed to just being able to manipulate you for a long time. And this is very unfair for you to step back and say you're not going to do it anymore. And Mars says, I'm sorry, I'm not doing you any favors. I'm not empowering you by doing it for you. I empower you by setting you free. And finally, after all of these centuries, having enough faith in you and enough faith in myself that if you step forward, it won't diminish me and that you are strong enough to step forward. And so we're doing this now, both with the masculine and feminine energy inside of ourselves and outside in our lives. And so Venus is going to have to get used to this. So what Venus did was she retrograded and she said, you know what? If I'm going to have to go out there and get it myself, I don't want to go get a blue one when I know I really want a green one. It might have been fun watching Mars run around there bringing blue and purple and green and orange until I decided which one I liked better. But if I'm going to have to go in the shoe store now and the shoe man is going to say, well, you've got to go in the back row, you've got to find your own shoe, you've got to take that ladder over there and you've got to climb up, I'm going to really examine those shoes before I decide which one I'm going to go climb and get and make sure that I only pull down the pairs that I really want to try on and not just, well, that one's cute, let me see what it looks like, even though I'm not, I know I'm not going to buy it. And so the Venus energy is, is stepping back. It's what's called a retrograde. Astrologically, when planets retrograde, it's a time that they transform, they regenerate, they repair, they make the corrections. It's a correction time. Astrologically, it appears as if the planet is moving backwards when actually all it's doing is moving a little bit further away in its orbit, further away from the planet, stepping back. And so with Venus doing this, she's getting in touch with, well, let me take a look at what it is I truly value, what I truly want. And there's two phases to the Venus retrograde. Now, Venus retrograde the day after the first eclipse, the eclipse I told you that was a really difficult eclipse. 
the eclipse that took place on the 28th of July. That was a really difficult eclipse because that was what we call an astrological term south nodal. Now south nodal means something that has to be fixed and cleaned up because it doesn't, wasn't done right. And it was a lunar eclipse. And a lunar eclipse means on an emotional level, it means anything connected to home, family, mother, emotions, anything on a cellular level. And so when we're experiencing a south nodal lunar eclipse, that south nodal lunar energy says, it's time for you to step forward and heal yourself on a cellular level. And when they talk cellular level astrologically, they're talking seven generations. They're talking about bringing stuff up from ancestors from seven generations back that will come up and stuff that we don't even recognize in our life that's going on, we're getting upset about things. So up until yesterday when we had the answering eclipse from when the first eclipse happened on the 28th of July through until the 11th of August, we were all cranky. And you can't tell me that y'all weren't cranky too. I mean, every little thing that somebody did, you're gonna jump on them anybody looks at you sideways, and even the sweetest of you, because you know, basically, even though I'm an Aries, I'm a very, very sweet person. But when I told my husband I was making a trip to Colorado, he said, oh, thank God. <laughs> and that's not a good sign, we're only married six months. you know. <laughs> but he left me a message this morning after the eclipse from the 11th, and he was so sweet on the phone, probably because I left him the first sweet message in two weeks the night before. <laughs> okay, but we're all processing and stuff is coming up that we didn't know what to do with because we didn't know what we wanted, none of us, with Venus retrograde and this harsh eclipse. All we knew and all we were supposed to know during that period of time, because Venus retrograde the day after the eclipse on the 29th of July, all we were supposed to know between those dates was what we didn't want. And so the energy during that period of time was kind of like, someone says to you, well, let's go out to eat. What do you want? I don't know. I know I don't want Chinese. I know I don't want Italian. I know I don't feel like Mexican tonight. I know I don't want to go to the cafeteria. I don't like that restaurant down the street. But I can't tell you what I want. I can only tell you what I don't want. And that's kind of what the energy's been like for the past two weeks until we just had this eclipse. And now we're first beginning to know what we want. And so it's a real interesting experience that we're going through now because the Venus is still retrograde, so we still have to fix. So it's kind of like we took everything that we didn't want during that period of time and we threw it out. Old emotions, old negative energy, hopefully old guilt, old shame, old blame, things that were inherited, things that we picked up from our ancestors, things that we didn't even need or want anymore. Hopefully we did a lot of purging a lot of body work, a lot of thinking, and hopefully we got rid of it. Because anything that wasn't thrown out before the 11th of August, when we had the new eclipse, now we get to keep it. But we have to fix it, because Venus is still retrograde. And so now this says, all right, if I kept this, it means there must be some value in it, because I would have thrown it away if I thought I didn't want it. And so now I've claimed the responsibility for fixing it. Whether it's an attitude, an emotion, an old pain. And so between the 11th of August and the evening of the 10th of September, you have to fix anything that is of value in your life that you didn't throw away. If you want to learn to live consciously in the new millennium. The new millennium actually starts astrologically on the 11th of September. The 11th of September heralds the time that we move forward on this planet with something we refer to as instant karma. And what is meant by instant karma is that humankind has evolved enough to be able to be held accountable for its actions within the existing lifetime. Does not necessarily mean that if you do something unkind right now, that within 30 seconds, something unkind is going to happen to you. Though I can't guarantee it won't. <laughs> it's instant karma. What the universe means by instant and what our reality of instant is could be six different things. But it will be shared. 
the response of it within this lifetime. And that's um, something nice for us that are spiritually oriented to hear. Because so often we see very cruel people having wonderful things happen to them in their lives. And now we have the thing of instant karma. If that's what's needed to assist them in involve, evolving and growing, then that's what we're up to. But we weren't evolved enough in our consciousness before September 11th, 1999, to move into that time of instant karma. We had to grow. And so what this means is that at least 51% of the planet understands the vibration of what goes around comes around. And so when a majority understands something, we are held accountable for that something as a collective because we're all affected by the collective which is why we discussed earlier how important it is that you have to pay attention to the thoughts, the concepts, the ideas, the words, and the deeds that you put out there at this time and forever. And that may be part of the things that have to be fixed be before the 11th of September. If we're holding judgment, guilt, shame, blame, holding things in our attitude that need to be fixed. You know, the bottom line is, I don't know if a science group believes in God, but I do. I'm a spiritual astrologer. And the bottom line is that God does not allow us to go through any pain that there isn't a gain connected to. And when we can ascertain that gain, it disempowers the pain. But when we stay stuck in guilt, shame, or blame, the pain is in control of our life, and we destine ourselves to repeat it over and over and over again, just with different faces and different names. But until we get the aha, uh -huh, and we stop the blame, it's not over. And we're gonna call it back to us again. And especially in the time of instant karma, it's gonna start coming around real quick. And a lot of us, or people we know, are still blaming people for the things that happened to us in our lives. There is nothing that has happened to anyone ever that didn't have a reason or a purpose that was useful and helpful to us in our evolution or it would not have happened, no matter how horrendous it looks. Now, many of you in the room will remember World War II and the horrific things that happened with, um, in Germany with Hitler. And we all look at Hitler and say, what a horrible man. Well, shame on us for judging him. Because if the hatred was not in the collective consciousness for a majority of the planet, that couldn't have happened. And this man stepped forward and he said, okay, I'm gonna claim the power of that hatred and I'm gonna move forward in a way that only hatred would allow me to move forward. And when we close our eyes, because we don't wanna see what's going on, we don't wanna be involved in the hatred, and it gets so big that it's about to consume the whole world and we finally step forward and do something about it, well, shame on us for closing our eyes. But we're in a new era now and so we have to be real conscious of opening our eyes and stepping forward and not allowing injustices to go unnoticed. It's what it's about right now. Okay, so you say to me, well, how can something so horrific that happens to a child have a purpose? Now, I know children that horrendous things have happened to them and it's happened for a purpose. I know children who I've been counseling astrologically, professionally since 1973, and I've drawn some really, really difficult um, clients to me during those years. And some of the stories are horrendous. But when you listen to what, was, what they birthed out of that pain, it helps you understand the reason for the pain. You just have to look. We can't judge anything or anyone. Like astrologically, we have something that's quite painful and that's called a 12th house moon. When someone is born with a 12th house moon, it means that they were not able to bond with their mother in this lifetime. That the mother either dies when they're very young, the mother is a workaholic or an alcoholic, has some type of escapism difficulty, or the mother is just doesn't feel a love bond with the child and steps back and doesn't bond with the child. And you say, well, that's not nice. But what happens is when we're born, our guides come with us through the birth canal and energetically hand us to the mother. 
The mother takes the child, holds her to the breast energetically and says, I will claim responsibility for this soul. I will nurture this soul. I will love this soul. And the guide steps back and the veil between the worlds begins to get a little thicker as we bond with the earth plane and the mother. And we begin to forget the other side. We begin to fall asleep on that side and get less conscious and get more cemented and grounded within the earth reality. Well, some souls that that is not supposed to happen to in this lifetime choose a mother that they can't bond with. And so when they come through the birth canal, the mother never takes the child to the breast energetically. She may breastfeed, but that doesn't mean she's bonding. Okay? She never energetically takes the child. So the veil between the worlds remains thin. And the intuitive part is very, very highly developed because it's never put to sleep, it's never shut down, as long as the child does not judge the mother's actions. Because if we say that life was painful because my mother never nurtured me, or my mother never did this, or my mother never did that, then we don't get to accept the gift that the pain of not being able to bond with a mother gives you. And that is being able to communicate with your guides all of your life, to be able to spiritually see on the other side. And I would imagine that many of you in this room with some of the very spiritual work that you do have had an absentee mother in some shape or form and have had to learn to nurture yourself. And because of having to take that extra step yourselves, your link with the other side is stronger and clearer. But your link with family may not be as clear. It's hard to get both. There's, there's trade-offs. Oh, well, I'll trade this for this. I don't need this this lifetime, but I do need this. At the time of conception, a honing signal goes out. And that honing signal says, this is who we are. The soul that needs the lessons that choosing us as parents can give it, let it gravitate to us. And as long as we have guilt, shame, or blame connected to our relationship with our parents and don't honor what they taught us, we can't move through what this eclipse pattern is trying to teach us and to move to where it's going to bring us into a brand new consciousness where we're able to create whatever reality we desire on this planet. And it's such a wonderful thing that the bulk of us, at least 51%, are ready to live consciously in the new millennium. Now, we have a couple of more interesting things to talk about, and then I'll take questions. We have a conjunction that's coming up in May of 2000, and I probably won't see you all again before then, so I'm going to share what this conjunction's about. In May of 2000, what's the date? I didn't write it down. And I don't have my reading glasses, so May is going to have to suffice. I think it's the 22nd of May, right around there. Um, the planet Uranus, not Uranus, the planet Saturn and Jupiter are going to come together. Now, this is wonderful for part of the new reality that we're creating because when Saturn and Jupiter come together, this is one of the best aspects for business that there is. And so any of you that are thinking about starting a new business, any of you that are thinking about doing money in a different way, and this is the year between now and May of 2000 to look closely at what doesn't work for you anymore and to just state the new ideas of what you would like to move forward with in May of 2000. Ideas have to be seeded before the aspect comes. So if you wait until the aspect arrives, you only get to take advantage of the last minute of it. But if you prepare, then you get to take advantage of the full thing. And so we have plenty of time right now to prepare to prepare for May of 2000. Now these planets don't come together that often. And when they do come together, they very rarely come together in a sign that rules money. And they're coming together in the sign of Taurus. And Taurus rules our value system. 
And so the energy of Taurus ruling our value system says that things connected to moral values, financial values, and spiritual values are going to be restructured on the planet beginning May of 2000. So a lot of the old structure of what we do financially we're beginning to release. Some of us are making these changes a little bit early, and that's okay. Because it's time to restructure our collective consciousness relative to money. And our collective consciousness relative to money, especially if we're spiritually based, very often um, on this planet has been, up until now, because it is shifting, and we begin to make the shift a few years before it comes. And so the collective consciousness for money for a long time has been, if I allow myself to have too much, that God will love me less. Because all the spiritual people don't have an awful lot of money. And all the rich people are mean and cruel and rotten. <laughs> and from struggling through eons up the ladder, because to be spiritual thousands and thousands of years ago, um, you usually were not in a position of power. And to be in a position of power or affluence thousands or even hundreds or maybe even 50 years ago, you had to be a little bit on the mean and cruel and rotten side. But that reality doesn't exist on the planet anymore. And so we have to place into our reality that God does not care if we go to the rivers of life with a teaspoon or a bucket. He's going to fill whatever we bring. What we do with it and how we get it is what's going to matter. As long as we get it in a kind and conscious way, this is what matters. And so this has to be programmed into our consciousness also before May of 2000 so that we can step forward abundantly. Because the Saturn-Jupiter conjunction in the sign of Taurus is there to teach us that we are supposed to live abundantly on the planet. That money is nothing more than an exchange of energy. Because the bottom line is when this lifetime is over, the only thing we get to take with us is how we shared our time and our experience with others. And so if we're going to share ourselves with another person in our business, we need to be compensated for that because we don't want to give ourselves away and we don't want to think that it's unspiritual not to share every part of ourselves because the time of the martyr is over. We're in the time of Aquarius. No more on the cusp between Pisces and Aquarius. Pisces is the time of the martyr. Aquarius is the time of technology. It's your time. Aquarius rules astrology. It rules technology. It rules higher mind activities. It rules humankind. It's when we learn to be a human race instead of a bunch of individual races because Aquarius rules humankind. And we step into the age of Aquarius on September 11th, 1999. No more teetering back and forth between the ages. And so we have to learn to use our mind and our intellect and to communicate because that's what this time is about on the planet. It's very, very exciting. We also, next week on Wednesday, the 18th of August, we have something in the heavens that is fantastic that is happening. I love astrology. It's my passion. Sometimes my husband gets jealous. Okay. <laughs> now I don't take my books to bed. <laughs> but on August 18th, 1999, we have a planetary configuration where every single planet, with the exception of Pluto, including the transiting nodes, is making a grand fixed cross. Now, fixed astrologically means that you will deal with it and you will deal with it now. Fixed means written in stone. Now, a grand cross in different, in, in cardinal or mutable, because we have cardinal fixed and mutable. And when we incarnate with grand crosses in our chart, it's usually only four or five planets. But now we have every single planet, including Chiron, whether you look at it as a planet or not, with the exception of Pluto, involved in this grand cross, saying we must learn to get this energy right, right now, because this is the signature that says you are being held accountable for it. And the only way to work through it is through the Pluto. Pluto is going to be the easy way through it. And Pluto is not an easy planet. Pluto rules life and death. Pluto rules transformation and regeneration. Pluto rules the phoenix rising out of the ashes.
Pluto rules something that we take from the bowels and we bring it up and we explore it and we look at every single aspect of it in great detail and we fix what is broken. It rules the surgeon's knife. And Pluto is the only planet not in this cross. So it means we have to turn to Pluto to relief. And so Pluto, the area of the body, because every planet rules an area of the body also. And Pluto rules the reproductive organs. Pluto rules the rectum, the colon, the bowel, the large intestine. And so it also rules the elimination. And so that means that we all have to be willing to get rid of what? All our old crap, excuse my expression. <laughs> We're not allowed to hold on to it anymore. Because if we hold on to it, Pluto is going to destroy us. Because what is Pluto? It rules transformation and regeneration. It rules bringing things down to its knees so that it can rebuild it. And so if we hold on to that old stuff, not only will we be constipated, but we'll go down to our knees or go down with the ship, so to speak. And so we have to look and say, well, where does Pluto want us to work? Well, Pluto wants us to work in the sign that it's in. So I suppose you want me to tell you what sign it's in and what it means. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you twisted my arm. Pluto's in the sign of Sagittarius. And Sagittarius rules our philosophical belief system. Sagittarius rules and teaches us that there is a common thread and a common denominator that runs between everyone's philosophy and everyone's belief system. Sagittarius is the common thread that pulls all the root races of man together and teaches us that every single living being on the planet, whether it is a bird, a rock, a fish, a human being, is connected. And God has given each and every living thing on the planet a piece of the cosmic puzzle. And until we learn to honor every single living thing on the planet, we cannot understand and see the whole puzzle. And we cannot function in harmony on the planet. And so we are being forced to learn to function in harmony on the planet now. And we do this through appreciation, recognition, that we are not the only ones that are special. Everything and everything is special. Everything and everyone has something to offer. Each of us has a piece of the cosmic puzzle. And it's time not only to step forward with your piece, but to recognize the pieces in others. Okay. Any questions? No questions? Oh, she's running for the microphone. Okay. I'd said sing till she'd get there, but you'd leave real quick. <laughs> First, I'd like to thank you uh, for verbalizing and validating what I've been feeling the last couple of years. It was good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is... Oh, by the way, you don't have to have questions. I take compliments, too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> my question is about the female in masculine energies combining together. Mm -hmm. um, I understand female implodes, masculine explodes, and bringing this together. In a conversation with my guides yesterday while I was trying to center and balance after the long airplane ride, um, I asked, what was the word of the blending? You know, we're not going to be, we're not going back to feminine, but we are, you know, we're not going back to masculine. We're, you know, staying at masculine. We're bringing these together. What do I call it? <coughs> And I was given completion. I'm a Virgo. I, I got to analyze this some <laughs> you more. You need more than completion, huh? Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't need any more completion. I need an understanding <laughs> more of the completion. OK, because I don't know what's more than completion. Yeah, I understand the completion. The under, it's, it's harmony. It's learning to live in harmony inside of yourself. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. What are you seeing for the first week in January? What am I seeing for the first week in January? That's a tough one. I haven't looked that far. It's going to make me see without my uh, reading glasses. All right. Oh, are you talking about Y2K? Yes. Oh, I thought you meant astrologically. I'm saying, oh, no, I didn't see that. <laughs> I missed something. Um, I actually, I'm not a technician, and I don't know the answer to that question. 
Um, I don't feel and sense that it's going to be as bad as seems to be talked about right now. I think there'll be computers going down, yes. I think we might have some power outages and some loss of water in some, in some areas. But I don't think it's going to be as, tr as traumatic, but I'm not technically inclined. So that's, I'm not the right person to field that question. But thank you for it. Okay. Thank you very much for coming and listening to me, your wonderful audience. And I appreciate being invited here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Karen. Thank you very much. Now, folks, uh, if you see uh, the people out there eating uh, lunch, uh, uh, Bob, Bob Dratch, Karen, and anybody else, uh, and the other two people, uh, Rodney Stitch and Barbara Nicholson, they're having a semi-private uh, probably situation there. The rest of you, the menus uh, are the, for the buffet are at the door. You can see what's being served. Thank Last you. year you were very complimentary about the, about the food being served here. Be back at 6.50. My lady to hear uh, about 40 more speakers in an, an hour and a half period of time.